Okay, our next speaker is going to be Fabio Franchini, and he's going to talk about frustration of being odd. Yeah, you better justify that title. <laughs> I think I will. Uh, thank you. I'm... <laughs> yep. Uh, this is actually uh, an homage to another uh, paper from 20 years ago in the integrable models was the importance of being odd. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm thanking uh, the organizer for the opportunity to speak in this interesting conference and for giving me the excuse to come for the first time in this great continent. I will tell you about something that we did recently with my collaborator Marco Giampaolo at the Ruggio Boscovich Institute in Zagreb and with the help of Flavia uh, Ramos who did the numerical DMRG part of the calculation in, uh, uh, from Natal. She's currently Natal. And um, I thank you for coming. I think that uh, you'll be surprised at what I will tell you because we definitely were as we were working on this. And our claim, what I like uh, to show is that if you take a system with a non excessive uh, frustration, so think of an anti-ferromagnetic chain on not number of sites, and so by, non, by weak, I mean that the frustration does not grow with the system size. And you consider a system that in addition to have this weak frustration also has uh, quantum interactions uh, with a discrete symmetry. What you generally obtain is a new quantum phase of matter, quite surprisingly, which is peculiar because it is gapless, but yet not uh, relativistic. In at least one instance, we find it will have Galilean uh, spectrum with peculiar long-range uh, correlations, which go with the fact that it is gapless, but by long-range correlation, I mean that they are algebraic, but not power law. And quite consequently, uh, this system typically violates uh, the area law for the entanglement entropy, yet not result in a divergence of the entanglement entropy with large system size. And this might, be, might seem like a contradiction, but it's just an oxymoron, and I will argue how that can be. And most of all, which I think is the most important property, this, state, this phase is extended, but most of all robust against uh, perturbation and showing universal feature. And what is uh, the final surprising thing in all this matter is that you don't need to consider very abstruse, very complicated model, uh, models to have uh, such phenomenology, but everything is, was under our nose for the past uh, 50 years because the natural, the prototypical example for such phenomenology is actually in the easing uh, chain, the quantum easing chain. So I... Uh, welcome questions uh, from everyone. I would recommend to give Fabian directly the microphone so that he can uh, interrupt me at any uh, time. This is the outline of what I'll talk. Since me, uh, most of the interest in physics come from frustration, I will remind you some basics on uh, frustration, and then I will immediately show uh, the results. Uh, the, there are two types of results. Uh, one are for the, for the correlation functions, which uh, we deem local and quasi-local. This is what actually done before us. And uh, our result instead uh, uh, is about the entanglement entropy, in which I will show this violation of the area law, which does not lead to divergence. Uh, and most of all, I will show that entanglement entropy, uh, despite this unusual behavior, collapses on, on a universal curve in the thermodynamic limit. And then I will uh, present the case of the Ising chain in which we can do all calculations analytically, and uh, this provides some technical explanation on the, uh, on the phenomenology, although it does not explain the universality. So, again, as it is often the case when you study the Ising chain, you never know how uh, general are the results that you can uh, take out of it. So, frustration. Frustration is defined as the effect of having competing interactions uh, in a system, each favoring a different order. So that it means that you cannot minimize all contributions uh, to your entanglement entropy at the same time and you have to do some uh, compromise. Notice that under this definition, all genu genuine quantum phase are uh, frustrated because uh, to have a quantum phase, it means that you have uh, different uh, operators that non do not commute in the Hamiltonian, and therefore, by non-commuting, you cannot minimize them 
um, independently. So again, let's take the example of the easy in chain, which is made uh, locally by uh, two types of interaction, xx and an external magnetic field and z direction, and these terms do not commute, which means that you have to take uh, to look for a trade-off between minimizing one or the other. But this is not what is commonly referred to as frustration. Frustration is something that came out in the classical uh, studying classical uh, system, and it is something that has very much to do with geometry. So the prototypical example is the one of having several spin, chain, uh, spin systems arranged on a loop, and uh, while for ferromagnetic coupling, whatever is the loop is not a problem to so satisfy each ferromagnetic bond, for antiferromagnetic uh, interactions instead, you can satisfy the antiferromagnetic constraint only on loops of even length, while for odd length you've always been unable to satisfy uh, one of the bonds, which uh, in, is what is called uh, frustration. And there is the famous Toulouse uh, criterion, which says that uh, to understand if the system is frustrated, you just count the number of bonds uh, uh, on, on which you have an antiferromagnetic uh, coupling, uh, along a loop, and if they uh, multiply to minus one, then the system is uh, frustrated. This does not tell you how much frustration, it just tells you that there is frustration. Of course, if your system has more loops that are frustrated in this sense, the uh, frustration uh, increases. So when I say that we consider a weak or non-extensive frustration, it means that I'm just considering the uh, unit of uh, frustration, which is just uh, odd uh, side chain with periodic boundary conditions. Notice that there is something here that I do not understand deeply, and if somebody in the audience has an intuitive explanation, I would uh, welcome it, which is that going from odd to even sides with an antiferromagnetic system uh, changes the degeneracy from twofold. Uh, so, in the, on the square lattice, you have the two nail order starting up or down, and all the other following. This gives two ground states from having an extensive number of ground states, which grows like two uh, n for the uh, frustrated uh, case. So, if you consider that this chain can be enlarged indefinitely, it means that going from n to n plus one uh, sites, even with n uh, very large you go from a, a double degeneracy to a massive degeneracy. And this challenges my intuitive idea of uh, perturbative effects. And I cannot reconcile, while this calculation is trivial, I cannot reconcile it with my uh, intuition. And I think that is, it would be interesting, it would be important to understand this, because this is uh, the key ingredient that changes the physics uh, that I'll discuss. So this is an important remark for you uh, to remember as you have uh, maybe issues in uh, accepting what I will tell you later. So, okay, frustration is a very uh, common uh, theme in, uh, in physics. Uh, in any dimension, is always due to the fact that you have a uh, closed uh, loop, antiferromagnetic loops, and it has been studied uh, very much in the literature because it gives rise to very interesting uh, physics. And typically, one is interested in a uh, case of extensive frustration, so where frustration is the major uh, player because you have that the number of frustrated loops increases with the system size. And this gives rise to uh, several uh, phenomenology, uh, which uh, all give rise to very different physics compared to non-frustrated cases. So, Frustration is known to give rise to peculiar physics uh, with a feature like uh, residual entropy at zero temperature, uh, zero modes, algebraic decay, artificial electromagnetism with uh, monopoles and their strings, and other uh, interesting uh, things. Uh, so, as I said, if you're considering it a uh, frustrated chain from a geometrical point of view, in a quantum setting, you have a subtle interplay because the quantum interaction still gives rise to local frustration while we still like to talk about frustration from, coming from uh, this uh, ring-like uh, geometry and the two things are hard to disentangle. So this is typically a hard 
problem. So we consider, uh, to start with the simplest case, which is just one DJ, one loop, so again, with non extensive frustration, but in that we consider the most generic nearest neighbor anti-ferromagnetic uh, quantum uh, chain, uh, of course, with periodic boundary condition because we want to consider this system in a loop. So for now, I'll keep uh, the coupling in front. So if the coupling is negative, this chain is an easy plane uh, ferromagnet favoring a ferromagnetic alignment in the XY plane with a positive uh, coupling, which is the case that I'm interested in. Instead, is an easy plane anti-ferromagnet, which can give rise to frustration. But there are several notable points in this generic uh, three-parameter uh, chain for delta equal to zero. Uh, this corresponds to the XY chain, which is uh, a case uh, which is mappable to free uh, fermion, so which is the simplest uh, case that you can treat. Uh, for zero magnetic field, this is the X, Y, Z uh, chain, which is integrable. So again, it has uh, special properties. For gamma equal to zero, you restore U1 symmetry, the freedom of rotation in the X, Y plane, which is a continuous uh, symmetry. Again, in this case, this model turns uh, integrable. It is the X, X, Z uh, chain. But this is, in our uh, we don't think it is relevant. I'll come to back uh, to it later. So we are interested instead in strictly non-zero uh, gamma, in which case this, uh, the only residual global symmetry of this Hamiltonian is the parity operator, which measures uh, the parity of the magnetization along the z uh, direction. And uh, for generic non-zero value of gamma, delta, and h, this model is X, Y, Z in an external magnetic field, which is non-integrable. So this is uh, really outside of the realm of this conference. Um, so as I said, if you have a ferromagnet, there is no frustration. In the anti-ferromagnetic case, frustration exists only, geometrical frustration exists only uh, if you consider uh, chains of, uh, num of n odd number of uh, sites. And I have to say that this case has not been looked much in the literature. There are studies for odd uh, lat, uh, chain length for the ferromagnetic case, in which there are interesting uh, and peculiar uh, in results, uh, like the paper I was referring to uh, before. But from the, anti, uh, from the frustration point of view, uh, I think that it was mainly looked in the case with a U1 symmetry where the effect of frustration is uh, trivial. So while for even chains uh, you can have the ground state at zero uh, magnetization with an odd number of sites, instead you can only have uh, half integer uh, magnetization, so you have a double degenerate ground state with total magnetization plus or minus or half. And okay, you can play with the magnetization, but it's not really in different from physics. Um, while in the case of Z2 symmetry, uh, this has been, as far as I know, completely overlooked until a couple of years ago uh, when uh, some uh, a paper by uh, a Chinese group uh, considered this in a quite interesting uh, way. Periodic. So th this is important. I have loops. So I, I, it's important to have frustration that I consider loops. So it is strictly boundary condition, and we think that anti-periodic or open boundary condition destroys it because, it, again, it breaks this uh, frustration uh, consideration. Also, uh, I will always consider H uh, less than 1 because when H is greater than 1, uh, loosely speaking, the external magnetic field becomes dominant, so we are in the universality of just having spin along the Z direction, so that is not, it's in a sense that the system becomes more classical. And so this is not interesting. So every, everything I'll say uh, applies to a small magnetic field, lesser than one. So the case... That may be right. You, you, you might be right. Um, but this, yeah, okay. Uh, so what, he, what we are familiar with, I remind you, is uh, that, again, you take the antiferromagnetic chain on an even number of sites, there is no frustration, and this is the prototypical model 
uh, in which uh, you have z2 symmetry, and especially if you take that equal uh, to zero, this is the case in which the, uh, the, the model continuously breaks uh, uh, z2 symmetry. Uh, so you generically have a gapped uh, system with a double degenerate uh, ground state, which gives rise to spontaneous magnetization because this degeneracy is between uh, st states with different uh, parity and consistent with the gapness, uh, the correlators decay exponentially. So instead, if you move to an odd number of sites, you have this situation which are with weak frustration together with the Z2 symmetry, and suddenly the system becomes gapless, but yet not relativistic. The ground state becomes non-degenerate, therefore you don't have any order parameters, so going from even to odd completely destroys the spontaneous magnetization, which is the hallmark of having uh, a Z2 symmetry, and this is particularly true for the easing uh, case. And when you look at the correlators, you have a mixture of both correlation that decay exponentially and some that decay algebraically. So let me concentrate for a moment on the special case of the easing chain, even though I will tell you more about it uh, later. So as I said, this is a case in which it can be mapped to free fermions, so you can go a great length in doing uh, calculation, so you can diagonalize your spectrum, you can characterize the state exactly, so you know that you can find out that the ground state is unique, but gapless, with a quadratic dispersion uh, relation. And as I said, there are two types of correlators, some which we deem local, like the uh, sigma z, sigma z correlation function, which can be written in this way, which is essentially like the usual one. But there are also quasi-local correlation uh, function, that was noted by Dong and other, uh, as I said, two years ago, uh, like the sigma x, sigma x correlation function. And if you're familiar uh, with the model, you see that up to here, uh, you have the typical uh, condition, but then you have this extra algebraic uh, factor. Again, later on, I will explain what is the difference that, between these two uh, correlators. And the best that we can say it is that it's related to the number of uh, fermions that appears after the Jordan Wigner uh, transformation, the, whether you have a non local strings or not. No. Uh, this, is, I mean, this is true for the non-frustrated case. In the frustrated case, as far as we understand, I mean, de definitely there is a, uh, a field theory that describes it, but it's none of the field theory that we know. So we don't know how to take the scaling limit of the frustrated case. Um, so, so before you were talking about uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, which uh, happens strictly uh, in uh, thermodynamic limits. Yeah, because on the finite system, there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, so for very, very large systems, asymptotically large systems, as I approach the thermodynamic limit, surely there uh, cannot be any difference in local correlations between even an odd number of sites. So the difference just has to be finite size corrections. Because you cannot tell uh, the difference uh, between uh, having... A, by, by local measurements between having a, a spin chain with 10 to the 23 and 10 to the 23 plus one sites. I agree with your general argument, but somehow this is not the case. Yeah, but, but if I look at your formulas, it's exactly the case. Because if I take... No. So, the, I'll, I'll, so uh, this is the whole point. So let me go a couple of slides more and then... Yeah, but, but, but the quasi-local correlations. If I take n goes to infinity at fixed I to, r... Yes, I, to, I totally agree. But let me, let, let me go to the next slide and then... Uh, and with regards to the spontaneous symmetry breaking, I was wondering about the following. So as we understand uh, in the U1 symmetry case, we understand actually quite well what happens with, with with even and odd. So uh, for, for odd number of sites, uh, you, the, the ground state uh, is uh, the endpoint of a one parameter family of states, which follow the, the single spin on dispersion, so to speak. But a single spin on dispersion has two endpoints with zero energy. And these basically, I would have thought, correspond precisely uh, to the two states which uh, will allow you to get a spontaneously broken yes. uh, symmetry state in the, in the thermodynamic limit, no? Yes, yes, yes. For, for the U1 case, I think that if everything is 
I mean, trivial. It's, not, it's still interesting, but there is, it's not as dramatic as I will argue that this is the case. Let me point out, I will... Mm, but, but your statement is, I mean, let's be quite well, let, clear let about me, this. My statement I mean, your is statement that, is, in the, let, let, me, yeah. let me state it. Yes. My statement is that in the traditional case, between the ground state and the next excited state, uh, the gap closes exponentially in the system size. And this is what I would call degeneracy. So at any final size, you have a unique ground state, but the gap is exponentially closing. Here, instead, it closes polynomially. And on top of that, you have a tower of states, and therefore, I would call that a critical phase, because that you not only have that the next state has a different parity, but the gap is polynomially, and on top of that, there is another one which has the same order of gaps, and another one, and another one, and another one, so this is a critical uh, phase. So I completely agree with all of this. The same holds true uh, for the U1 symmetric case. However, one has to be quite clear about the fact that the spectrum is not something that you measure. Yes, okay, so l let me go back to what I measured. So let me, so as I said, these are the two correlators. So uh, locally, as Fabian pointed out, they are indistinguishable. So if I look at the local quantities, frustrated, non-frustrated, I don't care. But this correlator is particularly important because this is the way that we calculate the spontaneous magnetization. We cannot access sigma x uh, alone because we don't know how to sandwich uh, states of different uh, parities. So we have to take this correlation function and we take the, um, the prescription that we look at anti antinodal uh, points, so points that are half chain away, and after that, we take the thermodynamic limit. So this is, again, a matter of limits. And you cannot take first the thermodynamic limit in which everything is trivial, and then you take the points to infinity. You have to take points that are half a distance, and then you take the thermodynamic limit. Well, but if I... you do that, you find that the expectation value of this is zero. Okay, but uh, what if I uh, define the limit in a different way so that I take the separation to be square root of n? In that case, it does not go, oh, okay, yes, but why? I still can use clustering. Yes, but uh, it seems, I mean, it, this to me seems a very natural uh, choice. You want to take the points as far apart. And in that case, this clearly shows that all the correlations uh, are killed. If you take square root, it, there, if, at finer size, you see that there is still some correlation, that you're still not uh, fulfill completely. So you can describe it, but to me, that, I mean, this is the best I can do. These are as fast as far as I can take. So I cannot take them further apart, and therefore, definitely, I killed all the residual correlation that can be. If I take square root of them apart instead, I could imagine that if I take square root plus one, there is still okay, something. Okay, but, but, but you see, uh, with regards to field theory or, or things like this, I think my limit is actually the, the, the one you would... Let me go, when I, when I show you the result about entangled entropy, then will we'll get even more confused or happy, depending on your point of view. So this shows that just looking at things locally, you get, a, a, in my opinion, a skewed point of view, because order, there is a local quantity, but you have to calculate it in this way. So this, to me, says that in this case, you have to consider uh, what we call an improved thermodynamic limit, which is a different prescription, in which as you take the thermodynamic limit, you also scale the distance with the size of the system. And I think this is the same thing as if you have a continuous symmetry, uh, when you take the thermodynamic limit, you keep, you keep the, the density fixed to have a uh, finite to deal with. In a Z2 case, you don't have a conservation of charge, and so it makes sense that instead you, what you want to keep is the density of sight uh, fixed, so you, um, you rescale R by N. So let me move to the calculation that uh, we did, so we focused on entanglement entropy. You already heard something about entanglement entropy uh, last week, but let me remind you uh, quickly um, what we are talking about. So again, we are, uh, the entanglement entropy is interesting when your initial state is pure, and typically you, we are going to be interested in ground states, and you consider a bipartition. So you take the system, a subsystem A, and its complement B, like Fabian uh, showed us this morning. And if you can write the total system wave function as a direct product of a uh, function of A and a function of B, then there is no entanglement. Well, if you cannot do that and you have to make a superposition of states of this uh, type, then the state is entangled because this means that any measurements on B affects the, the states of A because it collapses the corresponding wave function. 
okay, this is very natural, but then you want to quantify entanglement with a number. So what you do is that you construct a reduced density matrix by tracing uh, the B degrees of freedom. Typically, uh, the original system was a pure uh, state, so it was just a simple projection. After the trace, instead, it becomes a uh, mixed uh, matrix because you severed uh, correlation, so you have only partial information about what is left. And then you feed this reduced density matrix into the Feynman entropy, which uh, is uh, an entropy measure, so it just gives you the amount of information that you have in, uh, uh, in the reduced density matrix with just one number. So from a physical point of view, this quantity, the entanglement entropy, is very weird because it is definitely non-local, so there was some uh, resistance from the community, but it is very powerful because with one number you account for all different types of correlations that you can, uh, you can have, and so it shows very quickly the universal behavior in the system. So in particular, if I'm, I'm interested in ground state uh, systems, then we know that the correlations uh, decay either poly, uh, exponentially or algebraically, which means that uh, the correlation between system A and system B are localized around the area, around what these two systems have in common. And if the system is gapped and your correlations decay exponentially, so what influenced the entanglement entropy is just a shell of a few correlation lengths around the area, and for sufficiently large uh, system A, the entanglement entropy is going to be proportional to the area. This is the famous area law. In critical systems, instead, correlations decay slowly, algebraically, so you have correction to the area law, but clearly all correlations stem from the uh, area, from the boundary between A and B. And again, typically, you have uh, logarithmic uh, corrections, and that was proven that is to be true for one-dimensional system in the conformal field theory regime, uh, and in higher dimensional system when you have something uh, similar to a Fermi surface. So in 1D, let's focus on the case we are interested in, uh, the dividing the system into two connect uh, sets leaves a boundary which is just made up of two points, which means that the area law is, does not grow with the system size, so it means that for sufficiently large system, you have a saturation of entanglement entropy, as it is shown here for, again, for the easing uh, model for different system size, and you see that everything is very uh, stable. So the, the, regardless of how big the system is, uh, you have essentially no finite size effect, and everything saturates and follows the same law. Uh, for CFT, so if you are at typical uh, criticality, you have this prediction from conformal field theory in terms that also provides you very neatly uh, the central charge. And again, this in a log uh, plot is the behavior which is essentially sensitive uh, to a finite size uh, uh, system because um, there is no other length scale, so it very quickly saturates. So we're not the first one to, pro to present case for the area law uh, violations, but we are not in, we are doing, achieving it in different ways. So one known way to uh, violate area law is to break translational invariance by introducing disorder or some uh, couplings with a particular uh, form. Uh, definitely if you have long range uh, or non-local interactions, uh, then you violate the area law because uh, locality is not uh, very important in your uh, system. There were uh, two and papers and then the follow-ups uh, recently in which uh, they consider a frustrated free uh, system, as they called, uh, and they are probably the closest one to our case because they also involve uh, massive degeneracies. These are called Motkin and Fredkin chains. Uh, they have a very neat uh, construction also quite ad hoc, I would uh, say. And in this case, they get either logarithmically or uh, square root violation of the area law. But our is different. And this is what we typically see uh, in our case. So this is uh, for the uh, orange and green line is the typical situation that you have for an easing chain uh, with an even number of sites. Uh, which is uh, saturation e uh, easing or X, X uh, I think this is the X Z chain with a, long, uh, a parallel magnetic field. 
Uh, the red one instead is what you have for the easing chain at the critical uh, point, which is the logarithmic divergence. What we observe is the, are these two blue and uh, black lines. So you see that for small system size, it behaves as if it was gapped, but then after the, uh, this correlation length uh, it's uh, uh, reached for which you normally expect uh, saturation, instead the entanglement keeps uh, growing in a funny business, which is definitely not uh, the log type. Uh, typically in the business, uh, people plot things in terms of this uh, quantity, which is immediately uh, accounting for the periodicity and for the fact that entanglement entropy has um, a maximum at half the system size, so from which you can see better that the log uh, dependence is a straight line, but features do not change uh, qualitatively. So here we have a violation of the area law because the entanglement entropy does not saturate past a certain length scale, which instead is clearly present uh, here in some sense, which will be the correlation length of the unfrustrated model. So to understand what kind of area law violation we have, we uh, made some plots in the log-log uh, scale. Uh, for the easing, uh, the easing with the longitudinal magnetic field, which is non-integrable, and X, Y, Z with the longitudinal magnetic field. And you see that in the bulk of the behavior, uh, the entanglement is a power law. It's a straight line for which we can estimate numerically uh, the power. Uh, but So there is clearly a, an algebraic violation of the area law. Nonetheless, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, what we are interested in is this improved thermodynamic limit in which scales distan uh, distances scale like the system size. So what we also look at is to consider a system in which as you grow your system, you are growing your subsystem accordingly so that the ratio between the subsystem and the system size is kept fixed at a particular uh, ratio. And in this case, you see that uh, on the X line, you have uh, the system size, the inverse system size, uh, so that when you go to zero, you go to uh, the thermodynamic limit. In all the case, you have uh, a very uh, simple behavior that shows that the entanglement of it saturates at a finite value, which is non-zero. So as you take the system size to infinity and the subsystem size also grows uh, proportionally, the entanglement reaches uh, saturation. So we can, again, in the spirit of this improved thermodynamic limit, we can take this saturation value, AR, where R is the ratio governing uh, how you, uh, the subsystem size, and uh, compare this saturation uh, point with the behavior that you have for different values of the parameters of the generic Hamiltonian. And lo and behold, they follow one universal curve, which is independent on uh, the parameters and in which the only uh, parameter-dependent quantity is the value of the final saturation. Once you scale this, this is a perfect universal curve measured in terms of uh, dimensionless uh, quantity, which is the ratio between the system size and the sub-system size. And we, again, we have no deep understanding of this, but playing around we found that we can match this behavior with these uh, two curves. One is an uh, algebraic uh, expression, sort of a warped uh, parabola. Uh, but our first guess was actually uh, given by uh, the second complete elliptic integral, uh, the elliptic, complete elliptic integral of the second uh, type because of the shape. It immediately reminded me of that behavior to this funny law. And then I found that these two a function are surprisingly uh, close to one another. The, their distance is less than 1%, 0.5% at worst, and much, much. So I didn't know about this uh, approximation. And since I have no idea what is the universality behind it, I don't know if it is more natural to express it in this uh, form, which is definitely simpler. But with one-dimensional chain, you often have elliptic quantities, so maybe this is actually the true uh, behavior. But what this clearly shows is that there is universality fault. So this phase is universal and it is robust because it, these are not only points for the easing chain, but these are points moving away, moving around in this 
uh, gamma delta H uh, parameter uh, space. So this is phase with a universal feature and robust. So do you agree that this tells you that this improved thermodynamic limit is showing something? There is some question. So <coughs> I think one way of thinking about this system, if I'm right, is that you just have a system of even sides plus one excitation which goes around. Mm -hmm. So if I use this picture and I try to find what the entanglement entropy is between, between the... So will I get something like yes, that? Yes, absolutely. So the, from the point of view of the easing chain, this is exactly what the calculation show. When you do the calculation, all the quantities are the same as you would have with ground state plus one excitation. And the other way to phrase it is that the, what the frustration does is that it removes from your Hilbert space, or I mean, it gives a lot of energy to what it was the ground state, and so the ground state becomes the first, uh, the one more excited state. But this still challenges uh, what was the com common knowledge that also Joel Moore uh, talked about last week, which is that this is a low energy state. I mean, the lowest energy state after the ground state, and we expect it to satisfy area law, which is true if you're considering, if you first take the thermodynamic limit and then you're looking at things locally. But here I'm showing that in fact, as you take the system uh, size to be large and you're looking at larger and larger uh, size, in fact, um, there are correlations. So Just the, a moment, I mean, so, so let me ask. I mean, so that, that in, in this uh, particular limit you consider uh, that you get different results, I think this is clear because obviously you retain information about boundary conditions, etc., in this limit by construction. However, uh, before I thought you showed data uh, just for entanglement entropy for easing on even and odd chains. Yeah? Yeah, this is yeah, and, and, even and odd. Yeah. And, and you find very different behavior. I find that very odd now for the following reason. So the entanglement entropy is entirely determined uh, in terms of the reduced density matrix. The reduced density matrix is a local object for, for a finite subsystem. So it only involves the matrix elements are local correlation, local multipoint correlation functions. As we agreed earlier, uh, local multipoint correlation functions actually are the same if I make the system large enough, between, irrespective of whether it's even or odd. So how can the entanglement entropy be uh, qualitatively? But for the different? same reason for which you, well, no, it's too, back, too far back, uh, for the same reason for which you have this power law behavior. I'll come back to No, that. but the power law behavior, once again, if I take n goes to infinity and r fixed, it goes away. Yes. So if you, if you do a finite size in this case, so you keep R fixed and you take N to infinity, then you see that the slope of this curve will go down and down right. and down and down. So, so basically what you're doing here already is uh, you, 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 you basically consider your particular limit, which is not the standard limit we, we consider when we, for example, think about a field theory. Uh, I mean... Ni, yes and no. No, no, in the, in the field theory limit, you keep the distance fixed, take L goes to infinity. Yes, but what I'm saying is that if you do this calculation and you don't do it in a field theory, but you do it in the lattices, yes. I understand that since you have this expectation, you would do this. It's not an expectation. I mean, what I just uh, told you is basically how it is. That's a, that, 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 I mean, uh, otherwise, uh, you, you could, by a local measurement, tell whether your, your system has 10 to the 23 or 10 to the 20, 23 plus one side, and you can't. Well, um, again, uh, to me this is the same puzzle as for the classical case on the frustration, that you go from having a, a, a two-fold degenerate to a two and so My statement is the degenerate. following, and, and just uh, 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 tell me whether you agree or not. So. I consider a subsystem uh, of a fixed size. Microphone is not picking up. Sorry, I, I consider a subsystem of a fixed size. Yeah? Um, and I calculate the entanglement entropy of that subsystem with the rest of the system. The rest of the system I now make enormously large. Yeah? So take the subsystem, I don't know, 100 sides, and the rest of the system I take uh, a quadrillion sides. Yeah? I calculate the entanglement entropy. And then I compare it to the entanglement entropy where I add one side, one quadrillion plus one sides. I say 
the difference in the entanglement entropy is kind of like uh, one over a quadrillion or something like this. I take issue with that. If you calculate entanglement entropy from uh, the subsystem of size two to uh, half a quadrillion sites, plus one or minus one. I'm not doing that. I keep my subsystem fixed. Hundred sites. Okay, your, your system fixed? Okay, that's great. Good. That's Okay. okay, so, so basically, but, 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 the new things that... happen in your limit. Okay, I mean, I, I, I agree that I have to take my limit to make universal statement. But nonetheless, I claim that if you see something like that, and I keep increasing n, and I keep uh, uh, right, uh, calculating entanglement entropy for half the subsystem size, as you could do up to the subsystem size, you see a qualitative difference between this curve and this curve. So as you go on, this curve will go flatter and flatter, but as you approach uh, something like that, you will still see the behavior. And so if you decide to throw away all that physics by taking your thermodynamic limit, I think the that, field the limit, oh, that you, are, you are allowed to do that, but you're throwing away part of the interesting uh, uh, properties of the model. So that is my I, claim. I think that all that physics is called finite size corrections. No, because I have, I mean, these are not finite size corrections. As you, cal you are supposed to calculate the entanglement entropy up to half of the system size. If beyond that, it does not make sense because there is a duality so that the, the entropy of the system A and subsystem B are, uh, are the same. So you are allowed to calculate that quantity up to half of the subsystem size. And if you do that, you have a difference between the two quantities. So you can decide to ignore what happens for large subsystem size, which if you're interested in only local quantities, it's uh, allowed. But if you don't do that, you are just throwing away some physics. And it's not uh, finite uh, size because this is what happened in the infinite. Uh, so, so, so I think the difference is, uh, it's actually not finite size correction. I mean, so you're, you're in, in your particular limit, uh, you consider what I or what field theorists would, would, would call non-local quantities. And that's why the behavior is completely different. Again, um, I don't think that they are completely non-local. I think that there, there is... That, so, I think that typically when you do, uh, when you take the, the scaling limit to go to a field theory, your uh, regular regularizator, regularizator uh, to make um, universal quantities is the ultraviolet cutoff. Why don't you use the infrared cutoff? What, what is forbidden about this? And here I'm saying that the right thing is to use the infrared cutoff. To, so you have different universal quantities that you can calculate. You can calculate R over the, uh, the number of sites over uh, the lattice spacing, or you can calculate the number of sites over the total system size. And I said that if you're interested in understanding the effect of frustration, you should take the other limit. And in a sense, it's like I take the chain and I make my point denser, but keeping the length of the chain fixed, which is, uh, to me, the, what is this system uh, describing. So, <coughs> sorry. Uh, the interpretation of this result is that indeed this system has a finite amount of entanglement because it does not... Di, uh, diverge in the thermodynamic uh, limit and subsystem size going to infinity, but you have correlation that span the whole uh, system as if it was a critical phase. So this is, if you still take the point of view that is not interesting from your field theory point of view, I think it is still interesting from the point of view of having uh, an, a physical uh, chain, because it means that you can have correlation at arbitrary distance in your chain, regardless of the size of the system. These correlations are finite, and so this could be useful even for a technological point of view. So let me just recap uh, before I'll explain how this uh, comes about. So they have this new phase with both exponential and algebraic, but not power law, uh, correlation. And uh, we have this algebraic area law violation, which does not lead uh, to a divergence. And this is very much um, a robust phase, which does not require fine tuning. Yes, Sasha? Uh, I think if you add impurity at one particular point, it will pin that extra excitation, and it will not be robust. It will come back to entanglement, which is, which is area law. I what, what, kind of perturbations, would... what kind of perturbations are you considering against which it is robust? Uh, well, extended, I mean, everything that does not break the Z2 symmetry. So, so what I'm saying, just take small magnetic yes, to yes, some yes, particular yes. place, this extra spin will 
pin to that place and then the rest uh, will be insensitive to that. Might be from the Ising chain. I, uh, Ising chain, I don't see it right away because my excitation is a pi mode essentially, so it is very much extended. So uh, if, you, if you pin it, I'm not sure that it has a strong overlap with that uh, state. But it, I think that is a, is a valuable suggestion, but I would have to do the calculation. I don't have a strong intuition that uh, it would go either way. So let me explain how, uh, what happened with the easing chain that makes it so different compared to the standard case. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll show that for the case of the easing chain. Uh, so this is the easing chain. Uh, typical uh, way to solve it is uh, to map to uh, spinless fermion through the jordan wigner uh, transformation. But this is a very important uh, drawback because you have this, beside the fact that it is a non-local uh, mapping, but you pin uh, one particular site in this periodic chain to be the first one from which you calculate the chain. So in that way, you make translational invariance. So if you do the calculation, then you, you see that this gives rise to a non-translational invariant um, fer uh, free fermionic uh, chain. So the, way, the better way to do it instead is to begin with by dividing uh, your model by parities, so by, again, using this parity operator and then projecting it on different Hamiltonian, and then you do uh, the jordan wigner At that point, you remove uh, this impurity. The only thing is, uh, and again, you do the Bobo-Libo uh, rotation, so you end up with a free uh, system, but depending on the parity, your quantization uh, rule for the, for the momenta uh, is uh, changed from integer to half integer, depending on whether you are on the even or uh, odd parity uh, sector. Uh, the important uh, feature of having this different quantization rule is that in this function, you typically have this uh, spectrum, but at the zero and pi mode, um, don't have to be rotated, and therefore they might not be in continuity with uh, this uh, function, depending on where you are in, uh, in parameter space. Well, these are the true energy of the zero and pi mode. But depend, depending on the quantization rule, you might not have exact zero or pi mode. So this is the physics that gives rise Clearly, to the Z2 uh, symmetry breaking, which I always find it odd that in a periodic chain you have to uh, rely on very uh, fine tuned uh, continuation of your uh, square root. But this is also the physics here, and if it is legitimate to prove the Z2 symmetry breaking, uh, I can use it too. And uh, for sort of frustrated case, again, the absolute ground state is in the even parity uh, sect. It is never uh, degenerate. So in particular, for h less than 1, um, you have that you have an exact pi mode. Uh, was occupation actually lowers the energy, but you cannot occupy it because you have this uh, parity rule. So the ground state has to have an even number of excitations. So either you are with without this pi mode or with the two modes. So the ground is the one is the vacuum, but it has an additional energy contribution from the fact that this pi mode is not occupied. While exact take states are the ones that you that you get by occupying this pi mode plus another mode. So this contribution cancel. You have these uh, elements. So uh, you are that the excited states are in continuity with this uh, ground state, and you can expand it, and you can find that you have this. Uh, quadratic dispersion relation. So it, if in effect, it is as if the absolute ground state that you normally have has been taken away and you start from the band of the excited state. For the odd uh, parity sector, you start from the vacuum, which would have the lowest number of... Uh, uh, the lowest... Yes? Uh, again, that is a, a relevant point. I always consider translational invariant uh, system. I do not know how to do analytically if I break uh, that. Okay, for the Ising chain, there is some, there are some techniques. So I, I will follow it up. I don't have a strong intuition about this. So I would say that uh, this vacuum will have the lowest uh, energy, but is not allowed because uh, it doesn't satisfy the odd 
parity uh, requirement. So the lowest energy state is the one in which you add an almost pi mode, but it's not an exact uh, pi uh, mode. So this uh, state has energy greater than the absolute ground state, but crucially it converges to the absolute ground state in a polynomial way instead of an exponential way. And, and then on top of that, you can excite other single excitation uh, states, which again have the same, uh, very similar quadratic uh, dispersion. So you have these even and odd parity uh, sector states intertwining uh, that together form a band of 2n uh, states, because each, uh, in each uh, sector you have n states corresponding to the different quasi momentum that you can turn on. So to understand uh, the physics, uh, let me go back uh, to the h equal to zero point. So naively, you have the two uh, nail um, uh, states. Actually, they should have looked toward the x instead of, so let's think that this direction is the x direction. So you have these two ground states. But the problem is that on an odd number, uh, or an odd site uh, loop, uh, these have uh, domain walls between the first and the last site. Since you have translational invariance, there is no reason to favor those, so these are degenerate with uh, this, the, uh, all the other 2n states in which you have this uh, kink at all the other points, which gives you a counting of uh, 2n states. And, um, and this is the critical difference between having an even or not number of sites. So when you turn on a non-zero magnetic field, indeed, it mixes this state, but against the expectation, against what happened with other typical massive degeneracy, where the gap uh, is open, which is proportional to the perturbing uh, strength, so in this case, is not proportional to the magnetic field H, but is, uh, the gap is actually uh, 1 over N uh, square. And we think that this is because of Z2 symmetry. So the low energy state are indeed in continuity with superpo uh, superposition of this uh, domain wall. And then as you increase the magnetic field, uh, they get more and more complicated. So this physics depends on the same physics that gives you the frustration and that gives a massive degeneracy compared to a two for degeneracy depending on the number of sites. So this is what uh, I I agree naively with uh, Fabian's argument that having a trillion size and a trillion plus one should not make a difference. But indeed, there is, because of perturbation uh, idea, but indeed there is this point. And to me, this is... Once again, it's, uh, my, my point was uh, about local quantities. You cannot tell from local quantities... Uh, hey, I mean... He, I, I, this, I, is, I, this I insist... Okay. I, it, defining and, and local in, in the lattice sense, I completely agree. So I, I have no objection, of course. So because uh, that in global quantities, so in non-local quantities, there's a difference. Of course, we, 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 we have known this, uh, well, ever since the exact solution, because, of course, the spectrum yeah, of uh, the, the Hamiltonian for even and odd sides is different. We know this, but you mm -hmm. can't measure the spectrum with a local measurement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so, to understand the difference between this local and quasi-local, it is convenient to go to the usual uh, Majorana fermion pictures in which out of the creation and helation operator on one side, I make two real uh, fermionic uh, operators, which are the four Majorana fermion. This is the usual trick employed uh, since the initial solution of the easing chain. And then you, can, you use uh, the two-point function on this uh, quantities, so if you have the same operator A, A, or B, B, uh, they amount to a delta function, but the, so the only non-trivial one is the one between A and B, and crucially you see that the dis difference between this, this two-point green function between the, um, uh, uh, the ferromagnetic and the anti-ferromagnetic uh, case is a 1 over n uh, contribution consistently with Sasha's picture that this looks like a one particle excitation with <coughs> momentum uh, pi. But then when you do uh, calculations uh, for the spin quantities, you have to first transform in this uh, Majorana fermion. So the sigma, sigma uh, z does not have a uh, Jordan Wigner string, so it turns into a finite number of uh, Majorana operators, 
which means that the, these 1 over n contributions are finite, and therefore they're negligible in any thermodynamic limit you want to take, while uh, other correlation functions which involve a string uh, typically extending like the distance between uh, the sites, instead or, uh, involve, uh, here it should be L minus M, uh, M minus L, uh, L minus M uh, instead of R, involve uh, these uh, contributions which can be uh, sizable if you consider uh, large distances. And the point is that in, this to me is neither local, neither non-local because I can ask a, an experimentalist uh, to uh, measure the magnetization at the point X and at the other side of the ring. This is not really something that involves uh, a non-local uh, operation, although it has a distance. I don't understand. As, as, soon as, as long as you say the other side of the ring, it is non-local. Because local means that ring is infinite. I agree. So I... I Another way, another way of thinking this is that if you think about uh, of the ground state plus extra excitation, then whenever you say that this excitation in a pi momentum state, it makes immediately this, this state non-local. So whatever you measure characterizing with this excitation is yeah, from, from, from Yeah, from from macroscopic uh, point of view, I, I, I agree that there is no big uh, big mystery. The, the mystery to me is how this gets dressed up in the XXZ chain without a magnetic field, because in that case. Uh, quasi particle only uh, long lived, but they're not exact. Uh, but okay, we don't expect uh, dramatic things, so it's and, and numeric show that exists. But the point is to me, this improved thermodynamic limit makes uh, sense in terms of seeing that for any finite size system you have, uh, or, and, or also an infinite system, you have this no, uh, very long range uh, correlation. And so I think that these. Uh, could be described but by some different uh, field theory in which you scale uh, quant uh, distances with the system size. So these are my uh, conclusion. This part I uh, showed uh, before. It recaps everything that I've been saying. And the natural uh, things to do now is to consider other symmetry. This is a Z2 symmetry. It would be interesting to have a Z3 symmetry. We are already working on Z2 cross uh, Z2 to understand what else uh, can you do. Also, to consider next to nearest neighbor to have stronger frustration, which is extensive to see uh, what happens. And this uh, means that it could also be embedded in higher dimensional uh, system. Um, there is also quite an interesting feature that I like to discuss uh, privately about the fact that if you consider not the easing chain, but the XY, uh, chain, you enter into a phase which somehow spontaneously break uh, translational uh, symmetry. And, and I think that to me is interesting to understand the origin of this universality for the entanglement entropy because again it shows that there is some field theory that you can define in this improved thermodynamic limit which has uh, a physical meaning. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Fabio. So, any questions? Yeah, let me try to understand as a non expert uh, what you did to see if I have the right picture. Um, in the antiferromagnetic chain, the elementary excitations are basically semions, the ones that connect to the generate vacua. And for topological reasons, you can only have them uh, appearing in pairs. So in the even lattice point case, the ground state has none of those, and then you have two of them, et cetera, and that creates the gap. In your case, you have actually one semion already present in the system that cannot be eliminated for topological reasons, and therefore the ground state will include it, it will have degeneracy because of where it is, and it will not have a gap because then you can excite it. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is that you're taking a limit, a thermodynamic limit. Perhaps the one that you are taking is the one where the size of the system in space remains finite and the density of light its points yeah, this is what becomes I, yes. finite. And that's fine. That's a limit that you can take, say, in the Calogero model. Uh, if you take the limit where the uh, 
points remain fixed, then you go to the conformal field theory limit. If you take your limit, you go to these correlations, etc. Now, in that limit, in your case, because you have this excitation which has a continuous spectrum, you do get long-range interactions, mm -hmm. long-range correlations. And those are the ones that you are monitoring. Yes. And those are the ones that Fabian would say they are non-local, but in your case, they are part of... Yeah, to me, that, I mean, they are local in the sense that, as I said, I take the lattice space in to be... They are local denser, because you are uh, living in a space of finite radius, so anything is finite distance, so these are yes. kind of local in your case. So, okay, one may like or dislike that, but that's basically what you're doing. Indeed. All right, okay. Thank you for this clear picture. I completely agree with what you said about the excitation being present, etc. That's exactly right. But I don't quite understand one aspect of what you said, uh, because here it's a lattice model, right? And and the number of sites is uh, kind of uh, uh, related in a in a fixed way to to the radius of the circle. You can take this limit in the Sutherland. You can take this limit in the Sutherland model, mm -hmm. and then you get, you know, if you strange energies, correlations, yeah, etc. Okay. Yeah. If you take the other limit, your limit, then you get simply conformal field theory yes, excitations. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. So if I, if I consider the ferromagnetic Ising model in the ferromagnetic limit, if I just take a finite size system, I, I get that the ground states are cat states. So if I take the thermodynamic limit, I expect that to stay. So what I've been no, no, they, are, is, they, are, they are two degenerate states yeah. which in finite size are uh, uh, separated by a, an exponential small gap. So, so what I've been taught is to explicitly, first explicitly break the Z2 symmetry so that the, dis, the states are no longer degenerate, take the thermodynamic limit and then remove the explicit symmetry breaking. This is how we're supposed to end up with, this is supposed to be the correct answer. <laughs> so if I do the equivalent thing here, which is explicitly break translation invariance, take the thermodynamic limit and remove the explicit symmetry breaking, do you still expect th this kind of behavior to hold? Mm, I don't, okay. Uh, because momentum, momentum states are the equivalent of the Z2 cat states in the Ising model. Uh, Okay, it's an interesting question. I know that there is a paper by a Florence Group, a Campo Storini uh, et al, in which they did something similar. The antiferromagnetic chain on a number of sites on an open uh, chain, and then they coupled uh, the the last and uh, the first uh, uh, spin with a, a coupling uh, which they could vary. So this is, uh, in essence, what you are uh, considering. And what they proved is that the case that we are considering, the one in which you restore translational invariant, is uh, critical. Well, uh, and it's the phase transition uh, separating what I call the kink and anti kink. Uh, phase, uh, which indicates to me that there should be some robustness uh, against the uh, process that you're taking for the symmetry breaking. Uh, it will help, you know, I will have to do the calculation explicitly to be sure this argument holds. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Bob.